Good evening and um, uh, welcome everybody to our very special event for South Asian Heritage Month, um, Memory of Light and Lo Love's Right, um, an evening with Professor Ruth Bonita. Um, this event is a celebration of South Asian, in particular, um, in particularly Indian um, LGBTQI plus literary heritage. Um, Dr. Ruth Winita is Professor of English at University of Montana and was educated entirely in India and taught at Delhi University for 20 years. She co-founded India's first nationwide feminist magazine in 1979 and has published many books and articles, including Same Sex Love in India, um, Love's Right, Same Sex Marriage in India, um, which is um, pub published by um, Peng Penguin India, I believe. And pa um, her, her areas of research include gender and sexuality in British and Indian literature and cinema and Hindu philosophy. Her first novel, Memory of Light, appeared from Penguin in 2020. So, um, so, um, so um, I would encourage um, uh, all participants to submit um, questions um, as we go along. And um, I'll hand it over to Ruth. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share the screen yeah. and uh, show a PowerPoint. Um, is this all right? Can you see it? I can try making it full uh, screen, but it may or may not work. You'll have to give me a few seconds. I'll just try okay. and work. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking about uh, Love's Right, the book about same-sex marriage, and then go on to Memory of Life, which is a book, uh, which is a novel. Okay, so here, uh, um, as you may know, right now there are several cases pending in front of Indian courts asking for marriage equality under different laws. This is one of the couples who are petitioners um, asking for the right to marry under the Special Marriage Act. Now, uh, there is a common sort of idea in India that, that same-sex marriage or marriage equality is a Western import, a Western idea. And um, my book, Love's Right, which was written in 2005, and there's now a new edition in 2021. This book was written while homosexuality was still illegal in India. And, and um, it talked about many, the book, what is the book about? The book is about numerous young couples, mostly women, almost all women, um, most of them non-English speaking, uh, poor, low income women from all over the country, including Hindus, Christians, a few Muslims, Dalits, tribals, um, fisher women, factory workers, students, nurses, uh, these were women who since from 1980 to the present, the Indian press has reported these young couples uh, getting married by religious rights or, or committing joint suicide and leaving very often suicide notes behind, uh, asking to be cremated or buried together and saying that since they were not allowed to be together in this life, they will be married in the next life, okay? So this, uh, the first Indians, whose uh, first gay Indians, I should say, whose pictures I ever saw in the Indian press were not any activists or um, English speaking people. This was in 1980 when a press report appeared about two young women, Lalita and Malika, who had attempted joint suicide in Kerala by jumping into the channel together. By time, and they had left behind suicide notes saying, we cannot live without each other. So from that time onward, I started collecting these reports, which, uh, uh, which were appearing in the press. Uh, this is a famous case from 1987, where these two young women, again, totally Hindi speaking, uh, from a village in Madhya Pradesh, um, they got married in a temple. They were then suspended from their jobs and their family of one of them held a wedding reception in the village for them. Uh, uh, anyway, and very interestingly, one of their neighbors, when questioned about it, said, what is marriage? It's a wedding of two souls. Why does it have to be between a man and a woman? 
So I became very interested in this uh, question of why these young women all over the country were choosing these two ways of expressing themselves, marriage and death. Uh, joint. So um, the the uh, the book unfortunately is um, it's published by Palgrave Macmillan in the West and by Penguin in India. Uh, it's very easily and inexpensively available in India. And so if you have contacts there in the West, it's uh, very expensive, unfortunately. Okay. So there were many such young women, and some of them, the families uh, helped them uh, to get married. So what I'm trying to point out is that the idea of marriage is not a Western import. Uh, in 1987, when these two young women got married, there was no marriage, there was no gay movement in India, barely any gay movement, LGBT movement, and there was no, really no movement for marriage equality anywhere in the world. But what is more important, these women had not heard any word like gay or lesbian or any such thing they uh, were not in touch with any movement of any kind. This idea of getting married came to them just because they fell in love. And in some cases, the families actually uh, agreed. And so, for example, in this case, they got married at this temple in Bihar, uh, which is in Eastern India, yeah? Uh, here's another example from 2012. And, uh, you know, at least these women are nurses, so they are more educated relatively. But here are two young women who are tribals in Orissa. They are manual laborers, day laborers. And they have, obviously, they have no contact with any movement. They don't know any English. Um, and they ran away together uh, after a lot of negotiations with the family and the community. They were, uh, it was agreed that they could be married and now they are married, yeah? So this is, this is there are many such women uh, all over the country. And um, I haven't got pictures of, this is the temple where this is another temple in Assam and Northeast India, where two tribal women, um, Tingring and Roynati, the surname of both is Basumatari, they got married in 1999, as early as that. Um, and they had a very difficult time. They were persecuted in their own village. They went from village to village. Finally, the village in which they settled down uh, accepted them. One of them works as a domestic worker and the other works as a manual laborer. In 2006, interestingly, so that again, before any movement uh, for, for marriage equality and while homosexuality was still illegal in India, their neighbors asked the candidates in elections to ensure legal status for the marriage of these two women. Yeah, and um, uh, Tingling was interviewed, and this appeared in several newspapers, and she said, we know that candidates will make promises, but uh, may not fulfill them. But what hope, the only thing we poor people have is hope. Um, in 2019, these two very young village girls, they married each other uh, without any priest. As, I mean, some of these marriages were with priests, but here this was without any priest. They just married in a temple in Varanasi, in the ho holiest city in India for Hindus. And they said they were doing this because they want to live together, but their families are forcing them to separate. Now, sadly, after these marriages, sometimes the priests perform the marriages, but after that, the families, the communities force them to separate and force this. these girls are so young. They have uh, no employment very often or very low paid employment. They don't have any network of contacts outside their family. And so it's very hard for these couples to actually survive and live together. And then this is what happens in 2018. So I mentioned that in 1980, those two young women had tried to drown themselves in Kerala. And here in Gujarat, very far away, another part of the country, these two young women drowned themselves. And they wrote on this paper plate, the world didn't allow us to stay together, perhaps for the next birth we meet again. Uh, this is the suicide note written on a paper plate. So there are many such stories, which I don't have time to go into all of them. And what happens is that when these young women are able to approach the court and ask for help, the courts, all, all the courts have consistently said, well, these are adults, consenting adults. If they want to live together, nobody can stop them from living together. Uh, so yes, that's fine. But then after that, they do not have any legal rights. They can live together, but they have no legal rights. If the family supports them, fine. If the family doesn't support them, then it is extremely difficult for them to survive. Like this couple, uh, one, uh, one is a Sikh woman, the other is a Dalit woman in 2004. It is also was a case that came in the press in quite a big way. And they were actually helped by a lesbian uh, 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 um, organization in Delhi. But despite that help, they were harassed, they were isolated, and finally they were Mala married a man. Um, this was uh, the couple that helped a lot of runaway, but mostly there is no place for these young women to go. Um, same thing happened in the case of these two women were under police pressure and family pressure, Rajinder caved in and then Baljit attempted suicide. So, um, so
so this was one aspect of my research for Love's Right, where I write about these young women. And in the new edition, I have given a list of the more than 200 couples whose stories I've been able to collect. There are actually many more than that, because I, I was only looking at the English press and to some extent at the Hindi press. But if you look at the press in all the languages, and my, my search was not exhaustive, even in the English press. So there are many more than that. Um, there are also a few men I should mention. So uh, most of the couples are women, but there are also a few men. Uh, there's a Bengali couple in the two th early 2000s in, in a village in Bengal, who uh, one was a hairdresser, the other was a farmer. The whole village put pressure on them, including the Communist Party um, uh, uh, Council, which was uh, that, at that time the Communist Party was uh, in power in Bengal. And uh, finally, they committed suicide by taking poison together. Um, so, um, I also then wanted to look at the history of the idea of same-sex marriage or same-sex unions in India. Now, uh, in my uh, earlier work, like in Same-Sex Love in India, which I edited with Salim Tibway, we had looked at uh, more than 2,000 years of uh, discussion in Indian uh, texts in 15 languages um, of uh, same-sex relationships. So from the Mahabharata and the Kama Sutra through Urdu poetry uh, to the present, yeah? Um, However, what, when I was researching Urdu poetry for one of my books, Gender, Sex, and the City, uh, I found these fascinating descriptions by writers of the time, male Muslim writers of the time. Uh, they wrote a lot of poetry about male-male love, female-female love, and also male-female love. And in their uh, prose writing, they described this. Uh, this is Saadat Yar Khan Rangin. Rangin colorful is his pen name. And he described how two women would take a cardamom and break it open, and then they would get married, he uses the word shadi, among their female companions, and then they are called a cardamom or a lychee. And he also described many other kinds of, this is one of the poems, uh, where a woman is speaking to about her girlfriend, another woman. So in this poetry and this prose, I found lots of words for what we would now call lesbianism. I found lots of words for a woman's female lover, um, uh, again, I don't have time, maybe in the question period we'll have time to go into some of these words, but if we look at this poetry, uh, we find the whole range of moods and tones in which male-female love is described in the same way female-female love is also described in that way, and male-male love is also described in that way. Um, so for instance, in this poem, there's a lot of wordplay in the original Urdu, uh, which talks about being swept away by another woman. Uh, and uh, while in none of this poetry, even the poetry about male-female love, it's not what we would now consider sexually explicit, but it's very clear that these are sexual relationships, as you can see here from the, uh, from the uh, language. My hands devoted themselves to you last night. I felt so devoted to my hands all night. Literal translation is not possible because the, 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 the words don't exist. Uh, this is a manuscript of one of the poems, just to show you what it looked like, uh, Emma Dali Nisbat. Now, what happened to this poetry is that it was declared the, after 1857, when the British took over the rule of India and crushed the Indian revolt, um, the, the literary elites and the cultural elites in India, both Hindu and Muslim, became ashamed of their own literature, uh, for instance, of, of works like the Kama Sutra, which described male male desire in great detail. They became ashamed of it and they basically buried it. When I had to find this poetry, I had to copy out it out from manuscripts like this. I had to copy it out from ha by hand in the library, in libraries. It is, was not available in print. Um, this particular, and a lot of it has simply disappeared. This particular manuscript was, uh, was just not available. We just had a few verses by this poet. And then by chance, somebody discovered it in a secondhand bookshop in Pakistan, and he kindly sent me a scan of it so I could include this poet. Uh, this is the same poet who wrote this poem. Yeah. Uh, this is another one of my favorite poets who, who wrote about male male love. And uh, for instance, here's a poem of his between two men. A man is speaking to men to another man. And as you are reading the poem, because it is I and you, you don't know if it is to an, uh, whom, it, whom the poem is to. But when you get to the certain verse, it says, Jan nikle hai o mia de dal aaj vada natal bo seka. And the word mia, which, which is for, used only for a man. So it can be translated as, oh, mister, I am dying. Or, oh, sir, I'm dying, give it to me. So then it becomes clear that the man is speaking to another man. Also, the reference to the cheeks being blue caused by last night's sort of kisses is, of course, about the morning shadow, uh, the facial hair, uh, hair on the cheeks, yeah? 
So there was a whole genre of poetry called Chapti Nama. Uh, Chapti was a word for sexual love between women. Uh, Chapti means sticking together. Uh, and this word continued to be used up to the 19, at least the 1970s among courtesans. Uh, a historian found this word being used. And Chapti Nama, this is an example here in Urdu, was a kind of poem that told a story about lesbian love. Yeah. So, um, so in my uh, novel, um, this poetry is uh, hidden. It's not known. It's not in print. It's not taught. So in this novel, Memory of Light, which is set in the 18th century in North Indian cities in Lucknow and Delhi, it's a, the main story is about two courtesans. Uh, now, courtesans, I should point out, were not sex workers. It's often, they're often confused, but they were different. They were women who lived in, in female dominated households where the inheritance passed from both inheritance, both of skills and of property passed from mothers and to daughters and aunts to nieces. And uh, these women had what we would now call serially monogamous relationships with men. So they knew who the fathers of their children were, if they had children. So they had relationships. Sometimes uh, in later life, they also got married. And they were extremely educated, accomplished, highly educated and accomplished women. Uh, so, the, it's, so therefore, the two heroines are courtesans, Nafis, who is a poet, and Chapla, who is a dancer. And that's the main story. But around them is the story of all their friendships with men, with other women, with neighbors, the stories of the women, who, women and men who work for them, and uh, so on. So uh, I also depict in this novel two women, not these two women, but uh, uh, two others getting a nafis with another woman, getting married by performing a ritual that is witnessed by their female friends, uh, the kind that is described uh, by that uh, writer. And uh, this book is available uh, on Amazon. It's available as an ebook and also on Kindle and also available in print. Um, so anyway, to go back a little further, uh, into uh, so to come back to the idea of modern marriage, of uh, marriage today, uh, one of the marriages. Uh, what are the Hindu priests and the families thinking who perform these marriages, who participate in these marriages? So in this marriage, you can see on the both two Indian women, uh, Tamil women, and on one side the father of one and the mother of the other. The other two parents refuse to participate, and. I interviewed the chef for, for my book, Love's Right. I interviewed several priests and teachers who had performed such marriages. So I interviewed the Sheva priest who conducted the wedding. And he said, yes, I know I would receive a lot of criticism for this. And I had never heard of such a thing before. But then I thought about it. And I said that in Hindu texts, spirit is not male or female. And I think this is true of most religions, if you ask uh, uh, theologians. The spirit is not male or female. And marriage is a union of spirits. It is Hindu marriage is not a contract, just a contract. It is a sacrament. It's a union of spirits. So if the two get married, what's wrong with that? So he decided to go ahead and do it. Um, similarly, much earlier, this is the earliest book perhaps on Indian homosexuality is by this mathematician Shakuntala Devi. She was a famous mathematician. Uh, she was called the human calculator. Anyway, she wrote this book, The World of Homosexuals in 1977. And she interviewed a very major priest, the head priest of a very major temple in South India. And he, it's a long interview, which I also talk about but, uh, in my book. But he says, gives this idea that souls who are attached in one birth, and doesn't mean they don't have to be attached as a husband and wife. They could be attached as a, as a woman and her elephant, as a man and his um, next door neighbor or whatever. You could be attached in any way. The attachments, so when you are reborn, everything changes. And as you may know, four Indic religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism, accept the idea of rebirth. So the idea of rebirth is very widely known in India, even to non-Hindus. It's a basic civilizational idea. Uh, so the idea is that when you, when you are reborn, you change everything, your class, your gender, your species, everything can change, but attachments do not change. So you will be reattached again to the persons, the places, and the things you were attached to in the previous birth. And this idea of rebirth goes back a very long way. So I have found ancient Sanskrit texts which talk about how two people fall in, two men in this case fall, and two women fall in love at first sight. And they want to, they live together, they die together. Uh, and the description, and the reason for this is given as rebirth. So this is an old idea. In this book, I also found words for a uh, woman's uh, very close intimate female friend and a man's intimate male friend who is a self-chosen friend, a swayamvara sakhi and a swayamvara sakha. And here in this, in this uh, book, there are stories about a woman falling in love with another woman and a man with another man. And the explanation for these feelings is that affection which arises in the heart without a cause 
when you have no reason why you are falling in love with this person, it speaks of love persisting from a former birth. Okay, so uh, in Sanskrit, Vakti Jan Mantara Pritam Manaha Sneha Dakaranam. Okay, and that is a very widespread idea even today. Now, how does this and uh, karma or desire, which includes sexual desire, but it's not only sexual desire, is one of the classical aims of life and classical, that is ancient Hinduism. Yeah. Um, so the Kama Sutra written in the fourth century uh, AD in India uh, talks about, uh, everybody knows about the Kama Sutra talking about the 64 positions of heterosexual intercourse, but what most people don't know is that it has a chapter also on men who desire men. And it gives great in great detail how they can adopt certain professions like masseurs, like hairdressers, like flower sellers to meet other men who are interested. It gives a detailed description of oral sex between men, comparing it to sucking or eating a mango, which is something all Indians are familiar with. Uh, and this is actually a sacred test, text. It is a Shastra. Uh, it's the first treatise on the world on sexual desire but it, and, and all desire and pleasure. But it is not only, uh, it is not uh, just a treatise on, on desire. It is also a sacred text because karma or desire is one of the aims of life. Yeah. Uh, so the god of uh, karma, Kama Deva, who is very much like uh, Eros or Cupid, he shoots flowery arrows to make living beings fall in love. This is a larger than life statue, uh, 11th century statue, which is now in the Seattle Asian Art Museum. And it shows Kama Deva, the god of love, shooting an arrow at two women. Yeah. Um, so in the context of this, when I asked, uh, so there is a debate. What I'm trying to say is that there is a debate in India about uh, whether marriage equality is uh, a good idea or not. So many people, including many Hindus, would be opposed to it. Uh, but, and, and also, but many who are more knowledgeable in uh, in philosophy and in history are uh, are are in favor of it. Uh, this is uh, Swami Bodhananda Saraswati. I interviewed him at length for my book, and he conducted a marriage in 1993 of two men. And when I asked him, he said, "Look, all relationships are the same. All relationships will have ups and downs and will have problems. And ultimately, of course, the aim of life is to get beyond desire and to be liberated from desire and from rebirth." But in this life, if two people want to live together, they have to have blessings. So I conducted, this is the wedding in 93. It was conducted in Aditya's family home. His mother is there to the left side. It was very supportive. And um, uh, I, they're on the cover of this, of the American edition of the, uh, the hardcover edition of the book. Um, uh, later, they, they lived in San Francisco and later in life, they moved when they, when they had two children, they moved to India and they have been living in India for uh, 10 years. These are with the babies. Now the children are nine years old. But I just wanted to bring it back to the question of why marriage equality. So in India, um, uh, most people, what they really, when you look at those marriages from the 80s and 90s, what those couples really wanted was acceptance from their families and communities. But not having any legal rights also make, makes a big difference. So to give you the example of this couple, they are very rich and uh, so on, very privileged, you could say in one sense. And despite all that, the privilege and the money does not really help at a certain point because uh, uh, the American partner, Michael Tarr, he has only a tourist visa in India. He is a legal stranger to his husband in Indian law and to his uh, to one of the children to the to the children as well. Uh, so he um, has to leave the country every six months and go back after two or three days because he doesn't. Now, if it was a woman and a man married, a woman and a man who get married today, the very next day they can apply for for the foreign partner to get what is called an overseas citizenship of India, which gives the person the right to live in India without any visa for as long as they want to have a job in India, to have a bank account, and uh, just function in every way except for voting. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, but now, uh, Michael doesn't have those rights. And when the coronavirus happened, he was in England visiting his mother, and he's still stuck in England. He can't come back to India, and he hasn't seen his husband or his children for now close to two years because of this. Yeah. Uh, so um, this, that's, that's, that's why uh, the legal rights are important because people say like, why do you need the legal rights? But that is why legal rights are important. Um, and uh, uh, to come back even to those women like the tribal women whom I uh, talked about, um, say these two women, the two nurses who got married. Now they got married by religious rights, uh, but when they went the next day to the marriage registrar who was a woman to, to register their marriage with the government, they were told, no, you can do any ceremony you like, but the government doesn't recognize it. And the very same week, the landlord of their apartment tried to 
pulled through them out of the apartment. He gave them notice because he had read about the wedding in the papers. Yeah. So they have no protection. And they, of course, in the case of, as we all know, hospitalization, sickness, death, custody of children, they have no, none of them have any rights. Uh, and that is why uh, these two women lost their jobs, for example. So that is why the, uh, the case ha cases have been filed uh, to get married. But I, my, the point in Love's Right in my book is to talk about um, uh, the fact that same-sex marriage in India is not, marriage equality is not an idea that is upper class or upper caste or, uh, um, uh, or Western imported, or it is, a, it is an indigenous Indian idea. And, it's, and that is why I was so interested in this. And that is why I wrote the book because it was fascinating to me that the idea came not from the leaders of any gay movement. In fact, some of the queer leaders of gay movement are actually opposed to marriage because they think it's a heterosexual institution. But um, the idea comes from a groundswell of couples in India, many couples who are poor, who are low income, who had the idea themselves and never read about it anywhere. It did not come from the West at all. Um, and secondly, if you go back into history and into uh, literature and religion, as I uh, just talked about, there too you find that the idea uh, is present of a same-sex union is uh, present. It's not uh, therefore a modern or a Western idea alone. Even though today, of course, uh, we are uh, Indian courts are functioning in English, and so of course they are influenced by the uh, and uh, by the movement for marriage equality in the West. So I don't want to say that there is no influence of the West. Of course, there is influence of the West, but the influence comes from different directions, from the West, but also from India itself. So that was uh, that's the point of the book. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Ruth. Um, I, I I had. I, I, I mean, I had so many thoughts um, coming to mind. Um, first of all, like um, your book, L Love's Right, right is really um, a, a tribute to um, to the to this to this, to the couples who have fought for marriage equality in, oh, since nineteen eighty. 80s at least. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, ha how did you go about um, to um, to like document this? Like, document the these. Um... I basically, I'm sure this was happening before 1980 as well. It's just that yeah. once it comes, we get we become informed about it. So I collected every, in 1980, there was no movement in India. So I didn't even know any gay people in 1980, right, Indian. So I just started collecting newspaper clippings, not just about this issue, but every time homosexuality was managed, man, mentioned in any context in the Indian newspapers, I collected. So I have fat files of that. Um, most of the mentions in the Indian press were about the West. The only really Indian mention was of these young women who were going, committing joint suicide and getting married. So it was a fascinating phenomenon to me. Like these were the first gay Indians I saw, not any Indians of who were English speaking. So I uh, kept collecting this and I didn't write about it for 25 years because I was just thinking about it. Like, what does it mean? Why are they using this language of marriage and of death? And more important, why are some families accepting it? Of course, some families are violently opposed to it and, and lock up the girls and possibly marry them off. But some families accept it. Where is that idea of acceptance coming from? So that was my question. And then uh, when I started writing the book on the basis of all these clippings, I then also spoke to priests uh, and gurus whom I knew, swamis, who had performed these marriages. So I wanted to see where they were coming from and what their ideas were. Yeah. So And then that uh, gave me an impetus. I realized that rebirth is crucial to at least the Hindu understanding of it and the Sikh and Buddhist and Jain understanding of it. So I then went and I'd already read the text for my book, Same Text, Love in India. And I read the, I considered the law from that point of view, because that's a whole other question. India has a very different marriage law from say the US. So uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah, I looked at it from the angles of law, religion, literature, history, and of these young women. But these young women are the focus. I said, mostly young women, few young women as well. And, um... So um, uh, you mentioned the um, the caste and uh, like and um, the the um, po um, that there are uh, people from all different socioeconomic 
backgrounds, um, including um, uh, po uh, the poor people, and um, and so do you th do you think there's a there's um, like there's a an trend that the um, the Afri affluent uh, like the homosexualities for the privileged like oh today the weddings that are reported the same-sex weddings reported in the press today are all of rich upper jati mostly i should say all yeah. most and upper jati famous celebrities etc and that's very good i'm fine with that but i just want to point out that the pioneers and martyrs of this movement who committed suicide or attempted to commit suicide these were not of that group these were women from all over the country for about 30 years 40 years before right yeah. earlier yeah and uh, these, uh, and I should, um, an important point to make is that male female couples are also doing the same thing. In those same years, and even today, male female couples whose parents disapprove of their marriage for whatever reason, class or caste or religion, or just generally parents don't want them to choose their own car partner, and families and communities disapprove, they also have been committing joint suicide and have also been getting married by religious rites and temples. The only difference being that if they manage to survive and, and get married, then they have the law and bit behind them. They can, if they can migrate to another city, as they often do, they have legal rights. And the same-sex couples don't have those rights. That's the only difference. Otherwise, male-female couples have also been doing this. I should say that. Um, as far as the class and jati and so on is concerned, yes, they are from all uh, classes and jati. Sometimes they are from the same group, like in the case of the two tribal women. They have the same surname. They are from the same group. And sometimes, many, very often, they are cross-religion, lots of Hindu-Christian um, uh, couples, and uh, Sikh and Dalit, as I said to you, Sikh and, Sikh and Hindu. There are lots of across um, religion, across jati, across, um, not across class so much. They are within the same income group, pretty much. So when they're low middle class, both belong to that group. They're both nurses, they're both factory workers, they're both fishermen, and they mostly belong to the same group in terms of income. But yeah. yeah. Um. And um, the the Elaichi, um, sorry, the, um, you, you mentioned the, um, the the role of language that la language can play in um, like so, um, the the terms um, the t terms for for female to female relationships don't don't are, are not as well known as um right today you know, most people don't have don't know any words in their own indian languages so for instance the film fire which came out in 1990 in the 1990s it was a film about two uh, women um indian women uh, one of the women says there are no terms in our languages for this for this kind of relationship. That's not true. And one of the purposes of my research is to find what those words are. And there are words in Indian languages. It's just that we don't know. They have been lost, as, as I said, in the last 150 years after British education and administration and law, the uh, same-sex sexuality became unspeakable, which it had never been before in India. It became unspeakable. And so these words were lost, mostly lost, not entirely lost. But there are many words. There's a word dogana, for example, which is a which. So my work has helped bring these words back into life. Dogana, for example, means literally means a double fruit. So if you see uh, uh, an orange, where you sometimes see two orange flakes which are joined together, right? Um, or two nuts which are joined together. They are two in one. That's what dogana literally means. But in, it becomes very widely used in 18th and 19th century poetry to ref and dictionaries as well, not just poetry, dictionaries as well, uh, to describe a couple, particularly a female couple, a female couple, uh, to describe their relationship. So they're called each other's doganas because they are two in one, the other self. Do means two, the other self, so the other self. That's one word. Another word is the naki, which is also widely used. Uh, this was a ritual which two women used to perform where they would take a breast, a wishing, what we call a wishing bone, of a pigeon or a, a chicken and they would break, break it together. And that ritual uh, made them, uh, that, that bone is called zanak in Urdu. So they became each other's zanaki. So there are many such words. Gunya is another word still widely used for a female friend who could be a friend, who could be a lover, but an intimate friend basically is called a gunya. And that is used also for a female lover. So there are many such words and for men also. And then as I said in Sanskrit text, I found this word swayamvara, self-chosen sakhi, female friend, swayamvara sakha. So the words do exist and they are now coming back into uh, use a little bit. 
Um, but otherwise, most people think that these words, when you hear a word like lesbian, gay, homosexual, you say, oh, this is English, so it has come from the West, right? So I think that's the importance of knowing the words in uh, our own languages. Yeah. And, um, um, and uh, being based in uh, Britain, I think, I think a question which, um, which has to come to mind is, is um, you, you know, um, do you think there's a role which Britain can play in, like, in changing the legacy of the past, which of the anti-gay legacy? No, I don't believe in communities and countries interfering with other countries and communities. The change has to come from within the country, within the communities themselves. Uh, but yes, as a yeah, this is not a conscious effort to change, but for instance, when the, uh, the PM of Ireland came to India and brought his husband along with him, and there have been many such diplomats who have come from other countries which they're with their spouses, the Indian government has to welcome them as a spouse and deal with it, and it becomes uh, known to the people. So yes, in that sense, in the sense that it is happening in other countries, not just in the West, but in, say, uh, Japan had a, 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 a scarcely ever had any laws against homosexuality. China uh, got rid of its laws against homosexuality much before America did. So a lot of Asian countries, Taiwan now accepts same-sex marriage. So um, that just by modeling, that's all that other countries and communities I think can do. There's nothing else that they can do, right? In my view. So there's a question in the chat about if there's any mention of lesbian marriage-like relationships in the Kama Sutra. And uh, uh, so, yeah, my, so my, my novel, as well as my book, Gender, Sex, and the City, are about the Urdu poetry about lesbian love, right? And, and when you say the, the question says written by heterosexual men, now I have challenged that. Uh, there's, we have no way of knowing if these men are heterosexual. They certainly write as if they're what we would now call bisexual. They write love, love poetry about men in exactly the same tones as they write about male female love. So I don't, I don't think we can take these modern terms like heterosexual and homosexual and apply them to the past when there were no such terms. Uh, the, uh, the understanding of sexuality was much more fluid. It was not based on so much on gender as it was based on youth and beauty. The idea was that, as in ancient Greece, in ancient India too, that anyone can be attracted to anyone who is young and beautiful. So we may not agree with that, but it was a different notion. It was not that you're only attracted to men or to women or to both. It wasn't based on gender, so to, to that extent. Uh, in, in the Kama Sutra, it does mention uh, sex between women. It mentions sex between women, uh, but it doesn't really talk so much about marriage-like relationships between women. It talks more about marriage-like unions between men, which I have discussed in Love's Right. Uh, it's debatable, but the, the words uh, have more than one meaning, so yeah. Uh, and then another question on the chat is, did the head priest of the Vaishnava temple face opposition from followers and how did he face this? Now that was in 1977 that he was interviewed. There was no debate on the subject in 1977, no public debate. So he made he gave this answer to her and no, nobody challenged it at the time. There was no movement. So it was not seen as threat, as a particular threat. It was just his idea. And he being a head priest, everyone like respected him. So. Also, I think his ideas were not so much out of tune with general ideas. The idea of rebirth, the idea the spirit has no gender. He also said homosexuals don't have children, and that is what we that's good. We, that's what we need because we are on, we are producing far too many children, and that's too much of a burden on the planet. So he had his own ideas, and no, no, as far as I know, there was no opposition to it at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, um, so if um, if we, if anybody would like to um, uh, to ask a question, please feel free. Um, and um, well, I think more questions here in the Q and A section. Did I answer them? Sorry, there are two more questions here in a Q and A section that I see. Somebody, people have typed these these questions. Oh yeah, one. oh yeah, of course, yeah. One question is, when doing your research, did you get the opportunity to speak with trans women about marriage and relationships in India? Uh, see, I didn't base this on interviews with the women themselves or the men. I, I based it on the press reports, yeah? And in the press reports, there are reports, and I do discuss them, of uh, uh, trans women, uh, hijras at the time, uh, that's the Indian word, uh, one of the Indian words, uh, who got married to uh, supposedly straight men. And these marriages uh, were celebrated and uh, by religious rights again. So I, I did talk about that. Uh, another interesting point though was about some of these female couples, uh, one of the women 
either transitioned or thought about transitioning at some point. So early on, this is in the 80s, uh, maybe early 90s, there was one young woman who transitioned and she was transition. And she said, because I wanted to marry her. That was the reason she gave that if I become a man, I can marry her. And then she married her and they became, a, they were accepted by the family. So that was the reason that she gave. So there are different reasons for uh, doing, uh, given by these um, uh, people, it varies. But uh, yeah, that's about as much. Um, do you think the reason scriptural words shame has occurred because of colonialism? Yes. Uh, Largely, yes. Uh, not that there was no, of course, the society before there was heterosexism, but I, I have, uh, we have argued in Same Sex Love in India and in later work I've argued that the, the, the shift to modern homophobia of a virulent kind happens with colonial education law, which is passed in 1861. Section 377 of the, uh, the anti sodomy law was passed in 1861 by the British. And that's the first law against homosexuality in India, the first ever after that conviction start to happen. So um, uh, yes, it is to do with uh, British administration and British education, very important, which makes people feel ashamed of themselves, uh, not just on this score, but ashamed of many Indian practices, ashamed of polygamy, ashamed of polyandry, ashamed of courtesans, ashamed of same-sex desire, ashamed of worshiping images, uh, which is seen as primitive and backward and idolatry, ashamed of their own rulers. The Muslim and Hindu kings were portrayed by the British as decadent and licentious, and till date, many Indians accept that view of them. So, uh, so there's a general shame associated with Indian culture and a resistant, a nationalist response to that is say, no, no, we were always heterosexual and monogamous and just like the British and to sort of remake yourself as Victorian gentlemen and ladies. So, and this tendency on, on the entire political spectrum from Gandhi to the communists, from the left to the right, there's a tendency to be ashamed of pleasure of all kinds and sort of opposed to any kind of pleasure that doesn't have an educative purpose. So poetry should be written only to educate you. It shouldn't be read just for pleasure. And that was not an earlier viewpoint at all. So anything that is just pleasure for its own sake. So any sex that is not reproductive, for example, anything that becomes a suspect after the middle of the 19th century, after the British takeover. So yeah, and this I've made an extended argument in other books about this. And so have other historians. Uh, so then there was another, okay, so those were the questions. Okay, um, I think in the chat, there's, um, there's two more questions. Yeah, uh -huh. there's a question about Bhagiratha. Uh, one of the stories in Same-Sex Love of India covers the, uh, the story of Bhagiratha, mythological story of Bhagiratha born of two vulvas bringing Ganga and Ganges down and being born of two women. How easily accepted and popular is this Bengali version of Ramayana which has this story? Okay, so basically I have discussed this story uh, uh, in Same Sex Love in India, and, I, and the later 2008 edition of Same Sex Love in India, published by Penguin, uh, I gave several versions of the story. So the story is uh, available in Bengal in Sanskrit, in Bengali, and in several manuscripts of the Kritivas Ramayana. The Kritivas Ramayana is the most popular version of Ramayana in Bengal. It is the, the, the dominant, the major version of Ramayana, but there are many versions of it. Uh, there are many manuscripts of it. So in several manuscripts, this story appears in different forms. It's a fascinating story about these two young widows whose husband dies without a child. And then the two widows produce a child together and having asked medieval, medievalist scholars from around the world, I haven't found any other story uh, of two women producing a child after having sex, like biologically producing a child. So the imagination of these writers is uh, so much ahead of their time. Uh, of course, they would have seen co-wives raising children together. So the idea of having more than one mother is a very Indian idea. Two mothers, more than one mother. Rama has three mothers. So that's an Indian idea. But that you could have two biological mothers is the next step that this story takes. Um, how widely known and popular is it? It is there in some popular versions of the uh, Prithivas Ramayana in, in Bengal. So it is, not, it is not an unknown one, uh, I think. Um, I don't use the word mythology. So the question says the mythological story of Bhagirath. I don't use the word mythology simply because it is only used for Greek and Roman stories and for Hinduism. I don't find it used about Christianity or Islam or Judaism. So I think it, it kind of waits. So I use the word religious narrative or sacred narrative. Um, so somebody else asked the question, is Rekhti poetry, the Urdu poetry, which has same-sex love between women, easy to find and access today? Good question. So uh, in my book, Gender, Sex and the City, which is about this poetry. I've translated a lot of it. Uh, some other, uh, others have also translated uh, uh, some of it. These are first ever translations. 
in my novel, I've translated some of it. Uh, if you wanted to get it in original Urdu, now after, the, after my research and the work of a few other people, it has come back into print in Urdu. So you can get it, yes, there's several editions published in India. Uh, it was not in print, but now it is in print. It Break Free Poetry is now available in print in Urdu. Uh, however, interestingly, the poetry written by these same poets, uh, which is not about love between women, which is about love between men or between men and women or about just other topics, that work still remains out of print. Uh, Rangin, for example, one of the poets, major poets I wrote about, in their own time, they were very popular and famous poets. But uh, by the end of the 19th century, they have been labeled obscene and all their work goes out of print. Most of it, most of it, I should say. Now the poetry about women has, women's, women's love for women has come back into print, but the rest of the poetry remains out of print. Uh, so yeah, so I hope that will come back into print uh, too. Okay. Um, if you uh, come here, I want, I tried to explain the Bhagirat story to my family, but how do I find more about this version of the story? So basically, if you look at well, the translations that I have given of this story in Love's Right, as well as in Same Sex Love in India, look at the footnotes. And the footnotes will tell you the Bengali version, where the Bengali version is. So you can get the Bengali version if your family is Bengali speaking, if that's what you're looking for, I'm not sure. But that's, where you, that's how you can find it. Okay, another question has come. I've always been intrigued to know if Arjun as Brihanala ever indulged in sexual activity with a man. Is there any indication of it in Mahabharata texts? Um, Okay, not as Brihanala. Uh, uh, Arjun as Brihanala, uh, no, there's no indication of any romantic activity. However, in the Padma Puran, you can again look at Same Sex Love in India. I have trans we've had that translated and I wrote about it. In the Padma Puran, there is a lovely story about Arjuna uh, wanting to engage in the Leela, the sports, the love sports, the love play with Krishna, who is his best friend, as in the Gita. Uh, but as a man, he can't do that. So then the goddess takes him in the story, I'm just summing up, uh, to a lake and he goes into the lake and he comes out as a beautiful woman called Arjuni. Uh, Arjuni. And then as Arjuni, he engages in love sports with Krishna and then he again changes back into Arjuna, back into a man. And when he comes back as being Arjuna, he is very ashamed and depressed. And Krishna, who is, who is, who is, who is, uh, what, who is participating in all this, says, nothing to be ashamed or depressed about, my dear friend. And... Um, I think the context of this, see, um, these stories which are dismissed as myths, um, I, I'm not so much any more interested in just the stories themselves, so they are great stories, but I'm interested in what the stories are trying to convey. The stories are trying to convey to ordinary non-scholarly people certain basic philosophical points about gender and sexuality and, and, exist, and existence itself. And I think the basic point they are conveying is that everything in the world changes all the time. My next book, is, which is in press now, is on the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, it's called the Dharma of Justice. And there I make this point at more length that everything in the world, according to Hindu thought, changes all the time, every cell in everything. And as we know, scientifically, this is true, right? So everything that seem to be very stable and not changing, like the table, are actually changing all the time. They are a dance of atoms or cells or whatever you want to call it, right? It's changing all the time. And therefore, gender, sexuality, all these things we think are stable are not. They are all fluid and changing all the time. Uh, even species, even everything about you is changing all the time. Uh, your mind, your body, everything is changing. And this is expressed in the images of the gods, which I have in the PowerPoint, but I didn't show, uh, where the gods themselves are not simply male or female. Goddesses can take male forms and male gods take female forms. Vishnu takes the form of Mohini, for example, the enchanting woman who produces then a child with another male god, right? That male god has only two fathers and no mother, uh, no mother. So the gods are all things. They are fluid and they're changing and they take, and this represents the idea that the universe is fluid and represents the idea that all of us, you've heard the, you've seen the picture of Azana Ishwara, the god Shiva, who is half man and half woman, right? Um, uh, and uh, that's widely worshipped form of Shiva. And what does that express? One of the things it expresses is that everyone has, and this is not just me saying it, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, a major Hindu guru today, uh, when the 370, when the anti-sodomy law was overturned, he tweeted, he made a tweet where he said, uh, homosexuality has never been a taboo in Hinduism uh, because all of us have, he gave the example of Shiva and Vishnu. Vishnu is Mohini and Shiva, you know, is Ardhanarishwara. So he said, all of us have both male and female traits. Sometimes one is dominant and sometimes another. So everything is changing all the time. And as we know, that's true. You know, what you were at 20, you're not at 50. 
what you may have thought of yourself as straight at 20 and you may think of yourself as some as not straight as gay or trans or whatever else at 50 and the opposite can also happen right you may become bisexual maybe so these things are not fixed compartments that we like to think of them as that way and that, that is i think the basic philosophical point that all these stories express Um, we we have some thank yous as well, um, and um, I think I think there's one question in, um, in your personal opinion. What do you think it will take, and the steps India will have to do to return before colonialism force yeah, concepts? Um. Yeah, I think it's happening. There's a major, there are movements in India, many movements, many groups, and not just gay movement, LGBT movement, just civil rights groups. If you look at the political parties before uh, the movement in the 80s, 90s, none of the political parties, including the left ones, were willing to entertain any idea of same-sex sexuality. The left dismissed it as a bourgeois capitalist idea, and the right dismissed it as a Western uh, idea. So they agreed on that. Now all the parties are divided on the issue, all the parties. So, uh, so the, some of them have come around entirely, some are divided on the issue, and but it's no longer unspeakable as it was for 100 years or so, it's come back, right? So it is now being talked about widely, it's on television, there are television shows, I don't know if you saw this wonderful Hindi film called Shukh Mangal Jara Sabdhan, uh, it's about, uh, it's a recent film, a couple of years, a year or two ago, about two young men, low middle class men who have a relationship and how they deal with the families and all the problems they have, but it also shows a may may marriage, they walk around the fire together and they say to their horrified families, see, look closely at what you are saying, you will see many such marriages in future years. Uh, so I think the change is happening at all levels, uh, uh, in the movement and outside the movement as well. And uh, I think it's uh, the change in the law is very, very important. Whether these particular cases that are now before the court are successful or not, I think that change is going to come. If India is a democracy and that change is going to come, I don't know how long it will take. But uh, yeah, so it, I am, as Ting Ring says, all we have is hope. As that tribal woman said, all we have is hope. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you. thank you for um, uh, for taking those questions and um, your um, presentation. It's very insightful, and um, I look forward to um, read, reading Love's right, um once once I can. Um, or somebody, or somebody in India to get get me a copy of it. So, um, and um, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And I'd love, and if you read my, if you read the novel, it's a very short novel, so it's not a hard read. So if you read the novel, I'd love to have any comments. I'm on Facebook, and any comments you have on the novel, or you can leave comments on Amazon page as well. Oh yeah, okay, of course, yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Um, uh, so I think I think um, uh, I, um, I just wanted to um, once again um, thank all of you for joining us and um, and sharing your questions. Um, so I I hope um, I hope we'll meet again as well. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.